Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, I'm gonna give you a short explanation as to what the Starling Curve is, and I'm going to explain certain aspects of it. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to start off with some introductory information that is really important to understand in order to understand what I'm about to talk about for the curve. So the first thing is isometric contractions. So what is an isometric contraction? So imagine a muscle fiber that is fixed to two points, and this muscle fiber has a stimulus generator attached to it. So when we turn the generator on, a stimulus travels into the muscle fiber, which causes it to contract. And when the fiber contracts, the two ends are pulled in towards the center. And when they're pulled in towards the center, force is generated. Now, because of the fact that the two ends are attached to immovable points, the muscle length is going to remain constant during the entire contraction. The force that's uh, going to be generated can be seen here. So the force that's generated can be seen here, where the force increases over time till it gets to a maximum point, and then it drops off as, as the muscle relaxes. So this is an isometric contraction. So an isometric contraction is a contraction in which the muscle length remains constant during the length of the contraction. And these contractions are incredibly important to understand in order to understand the Frank Starling curve. The next important concept is passive versus active tension. So what is passive tension? So the muscles in our body can actually be seen as big springs. And the reason for this is because inside the muscles, we have these molecular elastic recoil proteins. And the major one is going to be tighten. So imagine you take a spring and you stretch it out by grabbing both ends. Now, when you stretch out a spring, there is an opposing force called the recoil force. And this recoil force works opposite of where you're pulling from. So it goes towards the center of the spring. Now, it's important to realize that when you release that spring, what happens? Well, when you release a stretch spring, the two ends come together towards the center and the spring goes back to its original position. Now, this elastic recoil force that we see as we stretch the spring will increase as the stretch increases. So as we stretch just the spring more and more and more and more, the recoil force will also increase. Now, it's this recoil force that is called passive tension. So the tension, passive tension is the tension generated by stretching the muscle. It's derived from the recoil forces produced by stretching the elastic proteins like tighten inside the muscle. Now active tension is the tension that is generated by contracting a muscle. So remember passive tension is when you stretch it, active tension is produced by a contraction of a muscle. So the next concept is the optimal length of a muscle. So imagine you uh, take a muscle fiber and you stretch it to a certain length and you stimulate it and then measure the amount of tension that's produced. And then you take that same muscle fiber and stretch it out even further. And then you measure the tension produced. And then you take that muscle fiber and even stretch it even further. You stimulate it and measure the tension produced. And you repeat that uh, many, many, many times. What you would generate is a graph like this. So what we see with this graph here is that the graph climbs until it reaches a maximal point around here. And this maximal point is the maximum amount of tension that the muscle can produce. And the length at which this maximum amount of tension is produced is called the optimal length of the muscle. Now from this graph, we can see a few things. So as we start moving away from the optimal length, both sides by either going beyond the optimal length or going below it, the tension that the muscle is able to produce will be decreased. Now, if we go below the optimal length, the tension decreases due to the fact that steric hindrance can occur between the myofilaments. So when you have steric hindrance, this basically prevents the formation of cross bridges and when we form, prevent the formation of cross bridges, maximum amount of tension is not able to be produced. Now, if we go beyond the optimal length, we stretch these myofilaments too far, which basically prevents overlap from occurring. And as we decrease the amount of overlap, this decreases the amount of cross bridge formation. And as we decrease the amount of cross bridge formation, 
we decrease the tension that's able to be produced. Therefore, in muscles, there is an optimum length where maximum overlap occurs, which produces the maximum amount of cross bridges, which therefore produces the maximum amount of tension that the muscle can produce. So those three things that we talked about are going to be incredibly important for this video. So now let's move on to the next part of this video by comparing the tension in cardiac and skeletal muscle and then using those ideas in order to talk about the Frank Starling curve. So now we're going to do something very similar to what we did in the last few minutes here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take cardiac and skeletal muscle, stretch it to different lengths and see what the tension is produced. And what we're going to do first is look at the passive tension. So when we look at the passive tension for skeletal muscle, it looks something like this. And what we see here is that as we stretch the muscle, very little tension is produced. And it takes a great amount of stretch before a considerable amount of tension is produced. So in other words, the skeletal muscle is going to be very distensible and flexible and it's easily stretched. Now, cardiac muscle looks a lot different. And what we see here is that, first of all, it doesn't take as much stretch to produce a certain amount of passive tension. So in other words, if you were to increase the stretch of cardiac muscle by a certain amount, and the, you were to increase the length of the skeletal muscle by a certain amount, the amount of passive tension that's produced by the cardiac muscle at that length will be a lot greater than the amount of passive tension produced by the skeletal muscle at that length. And what we see here is that as we stretch the cardiac muscle, the passive tension increases really rapidly. So what is accounting for this difference here? Well, the main reason why we see this difference is because of the elastic components. So the elastic components, like Titan, of cardiac muscle are a lot less distensible than the elastic components of skeletal muscle. And this means that the recoil force produced at a certain length will be greater in the cardiac muscle than in the skeletal muscle. So in other words, the cardiac muscle is a lot stiffer than the skeletal muscle. And as a result of this, when you stretch cardiac muscle, it's going to produce a lot more passive tension than you would for stretching the skeletal muscle by a, um, the same length. So now let's talk about the active tension. So we already know what the active tension diagram looks like for skeletal muscle. So let's really just focus on the cardiac active tension. So the cardiac active tension curve is a lot sharper. And what we see here is that there is a rapid rise in active tension and a rapid fall in active tension after a certain length. So why do we see such a sharp rise in active tension? Well, the reason why has to do to two things. So the first thing has to do with calcium sensitivity. So in cardiac muscle, after you stretch it beyond a certain point, the calcium sensitivity of the myofilaments is actually going to increase. And as you increase the calcium sensitivity, you increase the amount of force that you're able to produce. The second reason has to do with the stretch activated calcium channels. When you stretch the cardiac muscle beyond a certain point, this is going to activate calcium channels which are stretch activated and this will allow more calcium to come in which will further induce calcium induced calcium release which will produce a stronger contraction. So it's these two reasons why you have such a sharp rise in the cardiac uh, active tension curve than you do in the skeletal muscle active tension curve. Now, it's important to realize that this sharp rise and this difference in the uh, cardiac active tension curve is not due to an increase in myofilament overlap. This is because the dimensions of cardiac and skeletal muscle are very similar. So the difference is rooted in these two things. So why is there such a difference in the fall? Why is the fall of the cardiac active tension curve so much steeper? Well, the reason why has to do with the stiffness of cardiac muscle. Remember that cardiac muscle is a lot stiffer than skeletal muscle. And as a result, the passive stiffness that is produced at these longer lengths may actually impede with the development of active tension, 
and therefore you get a sharper decrease in active tension at longer lengths. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the ideas we talked about and use it to explain the Frank Starling curve. So in order to understand this, we are going to use this graph here. So on the y-axis, we have millimeters of mercury or pressure, and on the x-axis, we have end diastolic volume. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the relationship between these two properties pressure and end diastolic volume. So this curve is the diastole curve. And what it shows you is that as we increase the end diastolic volume, the diastolic pressure will also increase. And the systole curve also shows something similar. Where the end diastolic volume increases, the systolic pressure increases as well. So in order to understand what this curve is telling us, we have to show a few things. So the first thing is that pressure is actually proportional to tension. And the second thing is that end diastolic volume is proportional to sarcomere length. And the reason why is because end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that comes into the heart or the ventricles. And the more blood that enters into the ventricles, the greater the stretch of the ventricles. And as the ventricles stretch, this increases the sarcomere length. So what we see here are a few things. The first thing is that the diastole curve is very similar to the early part of the passive tension curve for cardiac muscle. So as a result, what we see here, knowing that pressure is proportional to tension, is that as the end diastolic volume increases, the passive tension of the cardiac muscle will increase. So the tension here, the pressure, diastolic pressure that's produced, is actually equivalent to or proportional to the passive tension. So as we increase the end diastolic volume or the stretch of the ventricle, we increase the passive tension that is produced in the ventricle as well. Now the same thing can be seen for the systolic curve. So the systolic curve is actually similar to the ascending phase of the active tension curve for cardiac muscle. So because of this, what we can say is that as the end diastolic volume increases, or the stretch of the ventricle increases, the amount of active tension that is produced by the heart also increases. And this is the main point of the Starling curve. So Starling's systole curve shows that the heart is able to generate more pressure or more active tension when more blood is brought into it. So this right here is the Starling curve. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how the Starling curve is actually not constant. It can actually be changed in different circumstances. And in order to show this, we're gonna use a graph of versus of using stroke work and left atrial pressure. So stroke work is equal to the pressure times the difference in volume. So stroke work is directly proportional to the pressure and pressure is directly proportional to tension. And left atrial pressure is also proportional to end diastolic volume. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw our Starling curve. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see what happens when we innervate the heart through sympathetic nervous system. So if we were to activate the SNS, what would happen is we would get this shift in the curve. So what we see here is that when we increase sympathetic stimulation, the curve will move to the left and upward. And what this basically is telling us is that in order to produce a specific amount of active tension, the heart through this sympathetic stimulation requires less blood volume inside of it. So in other words, you don't need to stretch the ventricles as far in order to produce a certain amount of pressure. So in other words, the heart is a much more powerful pump. And this is what we call an increase in contractility. So sympathetic stimulation is going to increase the contractility of the heart, which means that you don't require as much stretch in order to produce a certain amount of active tension or otherwise known as systolic pressure. Now the opposite is true when we get rid of sympathetic stimulation, where basically we get a downward right shift of the graft and this is basically telling us the opposite. It's basically saying that in order to produce a certain amount of active tension or pressure, the heart is going to require more blood volume. 
So in order to produce a certain amount of pressure or tension, the heart is going to be need to be stretched further in order to produce that tension. So this is a decrease in contractility. So I hope this video helped you understand the Frank Starling curve and also the differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle tension. So I hope this video helped you and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.